Thank you. <laughs> you may close your moxer for a few moments. On the very last day of his very long life, Moses stood before his people to offer one final word, one last teaching. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and your offspring would live. For 40 years, he carried us to freedom. Despite all our rebelliousness and recalcitrance, 40 years he searched our souls to find the sparks of light beneath the bottomless darkness of fear, beneath the endless appetites, the slavish craving for authority. Deep within he knew that we possess greatness, and he was determined to find it, and now, and now he stood before children and children's children, born free in the desert, hardened by hardship and hardened in battle, yearning to enter the long, long promised land and offered his final word, choose life, choose life. That is the soul of Jewish faith and culture. We are a people infatuated, obsessed with life. Every glass of wine brings a l'chaim. Every ritual commandment is annulled when it threatens life, health, and well-being. We rush to protect the weak, the vulnerable, the helpless, and the hopeless. We venerate beginnings. Beginnings. The Torah begins with the words, in the beginning. Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is the first of our high holidays. The beginning of each new month is celebrated with song and with feasting because to celebrate the beginning, the new, is to celebrate the always renewing possibilities of life. We choose life, and yet today, this once a year, today, we look in the opposite direction. We look to death to teach us all about life. On Yom Kippur, death teaches life. Death, it is said, closes doors but opens windows. Once a year, we confront our mortality, our finitude, the fragility of life in all of its terror. Today, we rehearse death. We fast and abstain from all that satisfies the body. We wear a kittel, a white shroud, that is, according to tradition, our death shroud, the outfit we will wear to the grave. We give vidui, a final confession. And again and again and again we recite this chilling faith, this chilling nature. Our origin is dust and our end is dust. At the hazard of our life, we earn our daily bread we are like a fragile vessel, like the grass that withers, the flower that fades, the shadow that passes, the cloud that vanishes, the wind that blows, the dust that floats, the dream that flies away. Why? Why this yearly focus on death? What does death come to teach us? Confronting death teaches us the truth about ourselves the truth we hide from all year long, because death wipes away all the ruses, all the rationalizations, all the faking it. Death destroys all the defenses, all the evasions, all the escape routes that keep us from seeing ourselves as we truly are. Confronting death dissolves the illusion that somehow we have an infinite number of tomorrows. It dissolves our procrastination, our hesitation to pursue our dreams, to reach our ideals, to become the people we are called upon to be. Death is the ultimate solvent. It wipes away all the getaways, all of the evasions, all that blocks us from truly living. Confronting death opens our eyes to what really matters. It wipes away all the trivialities, all the distractions that so preoccupy us. As the philosopher taught on Yom Kippur, we gain a glimpse of our lives from the perspective of eternity. And from that vantage, 
from the advantage of eternity, what really matters? What lasts? What is valuable? Death restores us to the truth about who we are and what we ought to do. On this powerful day, death comes to teach life. Human beings have always been captivated by the mystery of death. Some years ago, in southwestern France, archaeologists discovered the oldest evidence of human culture. It was a 50,000-year-old grave from the Neanderthal period. With its deliberate design and decoration, the grave demonstrated the capacity of early pre-humans for symbolic expression and culture, but more. It evidenced that early humans, just like us, felt a deep reverence and fear in the face of the mystery of death. And so it's curious, it's curious to me that the Bible dwells so little on death. The death of Adam and the death of Noah are not recorded. Abraham dies and is buried in four verses, Isaac in two verses, Jacob in one verse. The Torah's most important human character, Moses, gets seven whole verses. In terse language, his death is recorded in the closing, the closing verses of the book of Deuteronomy. Moses went up from the steps of Moab to Mount Nebo to the summit of Pisgah opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will assign it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the commandment of the Lord. He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab near Beth Peor, and no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when, his, when he died. His eyes were undimmed and his vigor unabated. Early in Deuteronomy, Moses begs God to reverse this terrible decision, to allow him to enter the promised land with his people. He litigates his faith. Let me complete my work. Let me liberate my people and witness the journey's end. But God refuses. And now as death comes, the Bible portrays him remarkably submissive. It was the rabbis of the Midrashic tradition, the rabbis of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries who could not accept that submission. The great prophet they imagined would not go so quietly into the dark night. The great liberator would not so easily accept the ultimate slavery, the slavery of death. He would fight back. And so they taught. When Moses was an infant, his cries aroused the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. The daughter of the very king who commanded genocide was softened, and she saved him from the Nile and gave him life, and now those same cries held back death itself. God sent the mighty angel of death to collect Moses' soul, but he could not. Three times he came. Three times he was repelled until finally the angel of death surrendered and returned to heaven empty-handed. The great masters of the rabbinic tradition imagine the most extraordinary encounter between Moses and God. When Moses learned that his hour had come, they wrote, he refused to accept it. He wanted to go on living, though he was old and tired of wandering and fighting and being constantly tormented by this unhappy and flighty people he was leading across the desert. He put on sackcloth, he covered himself with ashes, he composed 1,500 prayers, and then he drew a circle around himself and declared, I shall not move from here until the decree is revoked. And once more his words shook the universe to its very foundations. Heaven and earth in panic consulted one another. What was happening? And God decided, had God decided to put an end to creation? Then there came to Moses' aid the five books of the law, the Torah, which bear his name. They pleaded with God to extend his life, but they were unsuccessful. Then the fire joined their, its efforts to theirs, but in vain. 
Then the sacred letters of the alphabet stood up to appeal to God, but they too were rejected. Finally, Moses evoked God's holy secret name, but even the name of God was turned down. Its intervention proved useless as well. In Jewish tradition, Moses really is the most interesting man in the world. Moses really is the most realized human soul. But when he reaches the end of his days, he isn't ready to die. He fights for life. He calls forth all the cosmic forces at his disposal, all the forces that fought alongside him during his struggles of a lifetime. He asks them to fight for him, but they are unable to help. The Torah he received at Sinai, the pillar of fire that led him through the desert, the sacred letters of the alphabet which combined to create the universe itself, even the mysterious, powerful name of God, nothing could help him because they belong to the realms of life. Prayer, Torah, faith have the power to hold back the death of the spirit, but they could not defeat physical death. God loves this man. God loves this man enough to honor his humanity. God doesn't offer him a bargain on eternal life, doesn't tell him that he's going to a better place. God doesn't offer evasions or bromides. Instead, God appeals to his conscience. Moses, God asks, who are you? The son of Amram, said Moses. And who was Amram? The son of Yitzhar, said Moses. And who was Yitzhar? The son of Kahat, said Moses. And Kahat, who was he? The son of Levi, said Moses. And Levi? The son of Jacob. The son of Isaac. The son of Abraham. And thus to the first man, Adam. And Adam said, God, where is Adam? Dead, answered Moses. Adam is dead. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, dead, said Moses. They're all dead, and all the others too. All dead. Yes, said God. Your ancestors are dead. And you, you alone, wish to live forever? But Moses discovered in himself new gifts of rhetoric. Adam, he said, Adam, Adam stole from you. I did not. Abraham? Abraham had two sons, one who ran away and became a wild man. Equally true of Isaac, not me. Both my sons are children of Israel. They're good men. And at this point, God seems to have lost his patience. He said, Moses, you killed an Egyptian. Who ordered you to kill him? Not I. And once more, Moses found an answer. Yeah, I killed one Egyptian. But you, God, how many did you kill? You killed all the firstborns. You want to punish me? Moses knew, no matter how good his arguments, couldn't change the situation. Death is not fair. It never is. It never makes sense. Never. It will always be an affront, an insult, an invasion of absurdity into life's meaningfulness. That's why we protest. That's why we push back. That's why we cry and scream out. Death is the ultimate absurdity because human life rests on a grand contradiction. Physically, we are ordinary. We are made of ordinary stuff, and all stuff breaks. That's Isaac Newton's second law of thermodynamics. All stuff breaks, but spiritually, Morally, we are so much more than stuff. Each of us is unique, each human being infinitely precious. When a loved one dies, we wonder, how could it be that such a magnificent soul could be sent into the world in such a fragile and vulnerable vessel? There's no justice to it, not even for Moses, not even for the great teacher of justice. So Moses says, Master of the universe, if you will not let me enter Israel, allow me to remain alive like the beasts of the fields who eat grass and drink water 
and savor the world. Let me be like one of those. And God said, enough, speak no more of this. And Moses said, Master of the universe, if not like the beast of the field, let me become like the bird that flies daily to gather its food and in the evening returns to its nest. Let me be like one of these. And God replies, enough, speak no more of this. His life was never easy. His life was marked and marred by loss after loss after loss. Torn away from his mother when he was an infant. Raised in the palace with a confused identity. Always asking, who am I? Who are my people? Am I the child of slaves or the prince of Egypt? Where do I belong? He finally found solace in the desert with the tribes of Midian until that burning bush found him. That burning never quenched a man to go and confront power with truth, to go and confront Pharaoh, to declare, let my people go to battle with Pharaoh, the terror of the plagues, watching the world that raised and nurtured him torn apart piece by piece, and then finally the liberation, finally. But that was no respite. Now he faced 40 years of misery, schlepping this obstinate, rebellious, ever complaining, ever demanding, ever doubting people on his back. He offered them truth, the pristine word of God. What do they want? Feed us meat. We want steaks and chops and burgers and ribs. Forgive me. <laughs> he shared with them a vision of a life of freedom, a vision of a just society what did they want? Shortcuts, the easier way, instant karma. He brought them to meet God as he did, face to face. What did they do? They built a God of gold. They worship a projection of their own fear, their own neediness, their own smallness. He had every reason in the world to resign, to surrender to give up on God and on the world and this people. But driving him forward was this ferocious love, this ferocious love of life, of God, of truth, of freedom. And so he begs God, let me share the world a little longer. Even if it's not as a human being, let me take in the song of the world. I tell you, when I read that story in the Torah, when I read that story where he's told he's not going to go into the land, every year we get to that story, I pray that this year it'll end differently. <laughs> one year, one year, I want to reach that chapter and God will relent and say, go ahead, go into the land. Live in an old age home in Netanya. <laughs> Play chess on the boardwalk in Tel Aviv. Go tell children's stories in the streets of Jerusalem about the way things used to be. Papa, Mama, who was that old man you were talking to? Why, that's Moses, dear. He brought us out of Egypt. Really? He's still alive? Yes, honey, he'll always be alive. But that's the problem. That's the problem. If Moses remains in the world, we can never become what we are meant to become. That's the paradox. That's the paradox of everything precious in life. The paradox of children, the paradox of teaching, the paradox of leadership. The harder you hold on to it, the more you destroy it comes a time to let it go. And God knows this. Without endings, there are no beginnings. Without death, there is nothing new under the sun. So unable to compel him to accept his fate, God appeals to his deep love. Such must be the way of the world, he tells Moses. Each generation is to have its own teacher its own providers, 
Each generation is to have its own leaders. Until now, that has been you. But now it is your disciple Joshua's turn. Moses said to God, Master of the universe, if I must make way for Joshua, then let me return as his disciple. God replied, if that's what you wish, go down and do it. So Moses rose early to be at Joshua's tent where Joshua sat and taught, and Moses hid himself there. And the people came to Moses' tent to study, to learn Torah, and they asked, where is our teacher Moses? And they were told he rose and went to Joshua. So they went and found him. They found Joshua seated and Moses standing behind him. And they screamed at Joshua, what's come over you? You allow your teacher Moses to stand while you sit. And when Joshua recognized Moses, he tore his garment. He cried out and wept, my master, my master, my father, my father. And then the people said to Moses, Moses, teach us. And he replied sadly, I no longer have that authority. And the people said, we will not leave you. So a divine voice came forth and commanded, learn from Joshua now. And with that, the people reluctantly submitted and sat and learned with Joshua. And then the pillar of cloud came down and it surrounded Joshua. And after the cloud departed, Moses asked, what word did you receive? And Joshua replied, when the word came to you, did I ask you what it said? And in that instant, Moses cried out in anguish, and he said, rather a hundred deaths than a single pang of envy. Master of the universe, until now I sought life. Now my soul is surrendered to you. God presents Moses with the choice. It's either you or them. As long as you stay in the world, they will always look backward. Their greatness will always be in their past, in their memories and their fantasies and their myths. They will strive only to relive and recover and recapture and repeat what was. They will never grow. They will never move forward. They will never progress. With you in the world, there will be no Deborah and no David. Never be an Isaiah or a Jeremiah. Never be a Hillel or an Akiba or a Rambam or a Baal Shem Tov. With you in the world, they will never grow up. They will remain perpetual children, always seeking your approval, your permission, your assurance that things are as they should be. They will never find their own wisdom, their own strength, their own courage. Is that what you want? The bulk of the Torah... Moses struggles against this people. He struggles against the unrefined raw material of a slave nation, trying to bring them to freedom they could not imagine. Every page of the Torah is a struggle, a wrestling match between his will and their stubborn nature. And he keeps asking God, why did you make me do this? Why am I here? But in the end, in the end of the Torah, he changes. He realizes he's not doing this for God. He's doing this out of his own love. That's the great journey of liberation for Moses. He too is liberated. He too moves from a soul of obedience to a soul of love, the pursuit of vision and principle. He glimpsed who they could be. He grasps their possibilities. He sees the moral genius that lives in the heart of this difficult, argumentative, demanding, but passionate people, and he falls in love with them. He loves them, and that's what's at stake. When their potential, their future is at stake, he relents and he accepts. He accepts death for the sake of their life, the life of his people. Even in dying, he chooses life because that's the only thing that can possibly give death meaning and dignity and grandeur. And these are the last words of the Midrash, beautiful words. A divine voice came forth and said, the time has come for you to depart the world. 
Moses pleaded one more time, Master of the universe, I beg you, do not hand me over to the angel of death. God replied, fear not. I myself will attend to you in your burial. Moses spent his last hour blessing Israel's tribes and then escorted by the priest Eleazar and his son Pinchas and following his disciple Joshua, he began to climb Mount Nebo. Slowly he entered the cloud waiting for him. He took one step forward and turned around to look at the people following him. He took another step forward and turned around to look at the men and the women and the children that were left behind. Tears welled up in his eyes until he could no longer see again. And when he reached the top of the mountain, he halted. You have one more minute, God warned him. And Moses laid down, and God said, close your eyes. And Moses closed his eyes. And God said, fold your arms across your chest. And Moses folded his arms across his chest. And then silently God kissed his lips. And the soul of Moses found shelter in God's breath and was swept away into eternity. We will say tomorrow, Mi bekitso, umi lo bekitso. Who will die in their time and who before their time? And the answer is every single one of us. Every one of us dies at just the right time. And every one of us whose life is full and worthy and wise dies too soon. Sometimes way, way, way too soon. Because no life is complete. Because no one reaches the borders of the promised land and steps across. Wrote Franz Kafka, Moses is on the way to Canaan all his life. It is incredible that he should see the land only when on the verge of death. The dying vision of it can only be intended to illustrate how incomplete a moment is human life. Incomplete because a life like this could last forever and still be nothing but a moment. Moses fails to enter Canaan, not because his life is too short, but because it is a true human how to live with that incompleteness, that irresolution, is the great wisdom we seek each Yom Kippur. We know that nothing lasts, that whatever we have found in life, we will one day be asked to give it up. Because of that terrible, terrifying knowledge, we hold that much tighter to life. That much tighter to life, to the moments we meet, to the people we love, to the beauty we enjoy, to the values we embrace, to the visions we pursue, to the ideals that we share, we know that we will not reach the journey's end. But that's precisely what makes life such an adventure. That's precisely what death comes to teach life. With his very last breath, he taught us how to live and he taught us how to die. With his very last breath, he begged us, choose life. Amen. We'll complete our service if you'd please rise. Aleinu l'shabach. Aleinu l'shabach l'adon hakol Latet gedula leotze breshit, shelo asanu ke goyea aratzot, velo samanu kamish vefota adama, shelo sam kelkenu kahem, begoraleinu kefulahamon.